Uncle Dan. Hey, yo. <clears throat> you know, uh, we occasionally we like to dip a toe into the, the very rare, very, 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 uh, uh, very rare. Infrequent. Hmm. Infrequent bad side of religion. Yeah, it's almost like it's it's shocking to learn that it even could happen. But every yeah. now and then, yeah. something there's a bit of nastiness out there in the world, and it can happen with tiny little uh, enclaves of religions yeah. that yes. you don't even know exist. Yeah. So I think Uncle Doug has an exciting new oppression expression for us this week, huh? I do, and I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball in, in, in which. A, an atheist regime is stomping on the throat of a religious um, mm. uh, group. Fun. Yeah, that's um, nice. If, that, it's good to hear that it can go all the different directions. Yeah, and if it makes you feel better, there's a lot of people who suffer. So don't mm. worry. Hooray. Yeah. Um, well, dear uncles, we are what we would call an atheist podcast, mostly because mm. of all of the things we say. <laughs> and it is our editorial position that less religion is better and no religion is best. Unfortunately, history has provided us with precious few examples of a truly religion-free society. Um, the only truly atheist society that I'm aware of was the very short-lived and disastrous cult of reason yeah. in France that we covered back in episode 95. If I am wrong, please do at me. Um, the other examples that religious people always try and throw in our faces are, of course, Soviet Russia, Pol Pot's Cambodia, Hitler's Germany, North Korea, communist China. <clears throat> No matter how many times you debunk this argument, it never really goes away. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Like, the Nazis can all walk around with the phrase, Gott mit uns, yeah. God is with us, on their belt buckles, and yet uh, they're supposed to be an atheist. Regime. Exactly. So, so let's strike that one. They're the most obvious one from the list, because like you were saying, Uncle Dan, Hitler's Germany was avowedly religious, and until very late in the game, fully sanctioned by the Vatican. Right. Although all of the rest of these regimes tried and are trying to cast off religions that had previously oppressed their peoples, they are truly among the most religious societies in the world. It's just that the religion is the state. Yeah. Uh, watch the video of when Kim Il-sung died and tell me that's not an, a that's an atheist society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so, a cult. It's a cult. It's a cult. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's crazy is that we seem to be experience, experiencing the simultaneous collapse and ascension of religion in the West... So it bears mentioning that at least one out of every six people on the planet reside in a country that on its face claims to be atheist. I'm talking, of course, about communist China. Mm. In spite of the protests we are witnessing in Hong Kong, which as of this recording have not yet been totally and violently crushed, yeah. the Chinese government has been very effective in keeping its population in check with the notable, notable exceptions of Falun Gong, which we covered back in episode 60. And, of course, the Tiananmen Square crackdown in 1989, which possibly killed thousands of people. I think there's something amazing about the fact that you're talking about Tiananmen Square and all of this cracking down. And then from somewhere in Canada, we hear a siren. <laughs> Sorry, I was just trying to mute my mic. I, I, my hotel is like two blocks from the huge hospital here, so just be warned. <laughs> <laughs> that was a sound effect Cody put in for us. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, about 92% of the estimated 1.3 billion people in China are of the Han Chinese ethnic group. And so if China is willing to drive tanks into crowds of its own ethnic group, imagine the alacrity they would bring to repressing any one of the 52 officially recognized ethnic groups that make up the other 8%. Well, meet the Uyghurs. <laughs> Which was a great show back in the 50s. Do you remember that show? <laughs> yeah, right I just after thought the, the laugh track was so canned, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, but I mean, that was just part of yeah. the deal. Yeah. So uh, the Uyghurs are an ethnic and religious minority in Central Asia. The highest concentration of Uyghurs is in the northwest Shan uh, Xinjiang province of China, bordering Mongolia, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Uh, there so are a lot of stands. A lot of stands, almost all the stands. Uh, there are smaller Uyghur communities in all of those countries with some very small diasporic communities in, the, in Western countries. But the vast majority live in Xinjiang. Quick disclaimer, I'm going to say a lot of Uyghur and Chinese words, and I'm going to say them wrong. Yeah. <laughs> if this bothers you, why don't you he head on over to the Get Bent podcast and see how you like them, <laughs> Apples. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, I, I like your uh, preemptive uh, <laughs> anger. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm both pre and post. Um, <laughs> in the Xinjiang province, 80% of the 11 million Uyghurs live in uh, oases strewn throughout the Taklamakan Desert of the Tarim Basin. 
The Taklamakan Desert is definitely worth a look on Google Earth. Hmm. It's like God took an eraser to the map and just blotted out an enormous section. Hmm. Uh, most of the Uyghurs in this area live in the oasis cities of Urimshi, Urumshi and Kashgar. Whoa. The Uyghurs have been in the news lately, although not nearly enough, because a hmm. fat racist circus clown rage tweeting at a teenage girl is sucking up most of the news cycle. <laughs> they have been in the news because China, who let's just say has been less than kind to this minority in the past, has decided to see if they can't break some human rights records. Hmm. Right now, <clears throat> as we speak, somewhere between 1 million and 2 million of China's estimated 11 million Uyghurs are in what are called re-education camps spread throughout Xinjiang. Uh, that's at least 1 in 10. And a cultural and surveillance state experiment is taking place, the likes of which have never been seen before outside of dystopian fiction. So imagine if the unemployment rate in this country was 10%. We would be in a major depression or if not uh, a major recession, if not a depression. Right. Mm -hmm. Now imagine that it's not a 10% unemployment rate, but a 10% disappearance rate. Oh my God. And in typical communist Chinese fashion, that 10% 10 is made up of the most crucial members of a society, professors, Mm -hmm. intellectuals, doctors, et cetera. Can you imagine what that must be like? So, I mean, I think every group in history has the 10% group that they could imagine leaving and have a smile on their face. Oh, for sure. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, said, you said imagine all of these professors leaving, and I was like, Liberty University, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, before we dig into that fuck nugget, let's go back and look at, uh, at the Uyghurs, who they are, and how they ended up on the business end of 21st century ethnic obliteration. And how you spell it. Oh, that's, uh, there's various spellings. The one that's most common is U-Y-G-H-U-R-S, Uyghurs. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, think, I think we did that wrong. Anyway, keep going. (laughs) Uh, The Uyghurs are a Turkic people who have far more in common with their immediate neighbors in Mongolia and the stands of the steppe than they do with the Han Chinese. There are many theories about the origins of the name, but the real reason is most likely lost to the mists of time. Hmm. The Uyghurs consider themselves to be the original settlers of of Xinjiang, with some accounts having them go back as far as 9,000 years. It was probably not that long ago, but they have been there for a very long time. The Chinese government claims that they only arrived in the 9th century and that they displaced the original Han Chinese uh, inhabitants. More on that in a minute. (laughs) As you might imagine, inhabiting a region of the world for thousands of years that basically every single European and Asian empire wanted a piece of leaves behind a rich history, rich and complicated history that makes one feel ignorant and small. The Mongols, the Chinese, the Russians, the Indians, the Iranians, the Syrians, and the Turks, among many others, all spent time killing and fucking in that region. Mm. Religiously, they may have been practitioners of the proto-Indo-European religion we talked about way back in episode 10, before becoming Manichaean, then Buddhist, and then finally settling on Islam. Uh, The conversion of of Xinjiang to uh, Islam started in the 10th century, but was not completed until the 17th century. That brings us close to the modern day, when in 1759, the Qing Chinese military invaded Xinjiang to once and for all defeat the rebellious Buddhist Dzungars, who ruled at the time. Not seeing Islam as a threat, the Chinese tolerated and even encouraged it as a better alternative than Buddhism. They do not know the Islam that we know. They would later change their minds. Uh, The Chinese would never leave Xinjiang again, and in typical fashion ruled with an iron fist. The transition of the Qing Dynasty to the Republic of China did nothing for the Uyghurs, who rebelled and managed to gain independence twice. Uh, once in 1933 and again in 1944, they were backed by Joseph Stalin as a way of giving himself a bit of a buffer with China and fucking with China. The first rebellion resulted in the first East Turkestan Republic, but that only lasted a year before the Chinese regained control. The second rebellion lasted from 1944 to 1949 and resulted in the second East Turkestan Republic. But when Mao Zedong founded the Communist People's Republic of China in 1949, Stalin withdrew his support for the Uyghurs, and they were once again crushed by the Chinese. It's a happy story. Yeah. Um, Thank goodness for that. Yeah. The Uyghurs have never given up on their dream of independence, so a low-level struggle has uh, existed ever since, occasionally flaring up into violence. China is not known for giving up territory, and they consider Xinjiang to be an important buffer against the West, as well as having a lot of coal and oil. Mm. Oh, yeah. Well, they wouldn't care otherwise. Yeah, exactly. Right. (laughs) Exactly. So Mao embarked on a program of resettling the Han Chinese uh, into Xinjiang in order to dilute and hopefully finally eradicate the Uyghurs. As of now, half the population of of Xinjiang is Han Chinese. Hmm. So the Han Chinese were given incentives to move. And then once there, they were were and still are given priority in hiring, promotions, salary, medical care, etc. 
This has done little to engender racial harmony. And in 2009, things got out of hand. Two Uyghur factory workers were accused of raping a Han Chinese girl and were beaten to death by a crowd. The Uyghurs responded and the ensuing Urumqi riots uh, resulted in in around 200 deaths and over a thousand injuries. This was a black eye for the Chinese government that had just pulled off the 2008 Beijing Olympics as basically their entry into the modern community of families or (laughs) modern community of nations. Uh, Although China is officially atheist, they had tolerated the Uyghurs practice of Islam mostly. But now the Chinese government imposed a draconian set of anti-religious laws, such as prohibiting the growing of beards, owning of prayer rugs or Korans, and they actually made it illegal to quit smoking or drinking. <laughs> what? what? Yeah. Holy shit. That is awesome. I they meaning- <laughs> are just, I, like, if you're going to fuck with a community of people, go hard. <laughs> go hard or go home. Meaning you have to smoke and drink? Or you I just, don't know how if they, you I, do, you can't stop? If you start, yeah. you're, that's it. That's your life for ne- from now on. I couldn't find how they enforce that law, but they have well, it. Well, there's, there's a long history of that kind of shit. Like when, you know, the English took over, uh, after um, Cromwell, when the English took over most of Ireland, you know, the speaking Irish was illegal, food, the right. traditional foods were illegal. Yeah, you, you just kind of erase the culture. Exactly. Right. And that, that's the intention. Yeah. Um, uh, jumping up to 2014, President Xi Jinping went to Xinjiang, uh, Xinjiang to see firsthand how things were proceeding. And while on the ground there, there was a car bombing and a knife attack in a train station where Uyghur separatists stabbed over 150 people. Holy mm. moly. Yeah. What the Chinese government has decided to do in, in Xinjiang as a result has been, let's just say, a bit of an overreaction. <laughs> um, nothing like what is happening in Xinjiang has ever happened before in human history. A surveillance and internet state and, and internment state is being imposed on the Uyghur population that George Orwell could never have imagined. Mm. Uh, most of this comes from the New York Times, who's been doing incredible reporting on this for several years. But as you might imagine, it's not easy to get reporters on the ground yeah. or get sources to report what they are seeing. Right. After the violence in 2014, the Chinese government essentially turned off Xinjiang it's nearly impossible to get in or out, and social media is not allowed. Um, so then, just a few days and everybody's ago... everybody's just smoking and drunk. It's just a fucking <laughs> wreck. Uh, just a few days ago, someone much braver than me leaked nearly 400 pages of internal Chinese government documents wow. detailing some of what's going on in Xinjiang. Basically, there are cameras everywhere with facial recognition software. Yeah. And I mean, everywhere at intersections, telephone poles, stores, mosques, subways, buses, etc. Some are meant to be seen and some are not and are hidden. Uh, there is nowhere you can go in Xinjiang where you are not seen, recognized or logged. Uh, and by the way, Xinjiang is 640,000 square miles, basically the same size as Alaska. Holy shit. The what? Chinese government has set up checkpoints on nearly every block and have what they call, uh, quote, conser- uh, convenience police stations every couple of blocks. This is crazy. Uyghurs have to have their IDs scanned and are photographed anywhere they go, often several times. A, f- a couple years ago, all Uyghurs were required to report for mandatory medical examinations in which blood, saliva, hair, and biometric data were taken. Fuck. All of this is going on to one huge database. And then there are the camps. Which, I, I mean... Th- this is all I, you're getting to the most horrific. It's all kind of horrific, but I do want to point out what a great opportunity for us to study some people. <laughs> we have all of their information. Yes, yes. There, exactly. at some point, I'm sure scientists will learn a lot from this. Yes. <laughs> I, what, what wonderful silver lining there to find, Doctor Mangala. <laughs> yeah, that, so, that it will put medical research ahead years. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, the, in the camps, basically, anyone who has said anything negative about the government has a criminal record or is perceived to be sour on their current state of affairs has been swept up and interned in one of the many camps that have been built around the, uh, the region in the last couple of years. Like I said at the beginning, there are currently between one to two million Uyghurs in these camps, and they are building more. Um, wow. The initial stint in one of these camps is one year, but this can be extended if one does not show proper uh, re-education. This is fucked up. Or if one's family is not properly deferential. This includes family abroad. So if your relative is in a camp and you happen to live in the U.S., for example, the Chinese government is monitoring your social media. And if you say anything negative about the situation, they will add months to your relative's incarceration and they may even sweep up more of your family. I mean, at this point, do you really even ever hope 
for being able for getting out like i I, it seems like it would be foolhardy to even believe that you're ever going to leave that place. I don't. I, I agree. Um, <sighs> they've even produced pamphlets for people to use when talking to their children about why mommy or daddy has vanished. Oh my god! Oh my god. Uh, and the talking points are chilling. It starts off with some pretty anodyne things like they're off at school and they're being taken uh, well, well taken care of. But if the child persists in asking questions, the talking points drop all pretense and pretty much tell the child. Stop asking questions or mommy will never come home. Oh, my God. As you might imagine, the climate of fear this has produced is paralyzing. Mosques are closed. The streets are empty. And people are not even sure if they are being monitored and filmed in their own houses. Um, What the Chinese government is doing with this database uh, and what their long-term plans are for these camps is not known, but it cannot be good. Um, It has been the long-stated goal uh, of the Chinese government uh, to undergo to, uh, the Chinese government to go through sinicization with all of these ethnic groups. That is to say, the destruction of all non-Chinese cultural and religious practices and the full assimila- assimilation of non-Han Chinese ethnicities. But it was a really long-term plan. It seems that with the Uyghurs, they've decided to speed things up a bit. So all of this is, is to say that we may be witnessing the end of, a, of an ethnicity and a culture that goes back thousands of years. They are being eradicated because they are different, for sure, but mostly because they are Muslim. Yeah. S- several Western countries have sent milk toast letters of condemnation to China and the UN, urging China to free the Uyghurs. But in July of this year, ambassador- ambassadors from 37 countries signed a joint letter to the UN Human Rights Council supporting China's actions. What? what? This list included ambassadors from Saudi Arabia, Syria, yeah. Pakistan, Kuwait, Oman, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain. Muslim That's countries? Some, some of the most powerful and wealthy Muslim countries in the world. That is insane. Throwing their support behind the almost certain genocide of a Muslim population. Now, before Jesus you ask, Christ. the United States was not on the list of countries supporting China. I'm almost shocked that that's the case. But it was yeah. also not on the list of countries condemning China. Right. Um, just days ago, Mike Pompeo, um, Secretary of State, was to announce sanctions on Chinese officials linked to this terror. But his piece of shit boss wants a trade deal with China. So suck it, Uyghurs. Uh, Just to be clear, the trade deal that Trump has just announced with China is called the phase one deal. It's phase one because Trump kicked all the difficult issues into phase two so that he could could announce this non-deal and try and distract from impeachment. So he could have a a win that means nothing. I just want to put that little cherry on top of the shit Quick question. What what possible motivation – I mean it's probably just money, but why why would the Saudis and the Bahrainis and why would they not – why would they – it's because they they like repression more than they like fellow Muslims, wow. and what China this is the thing what China is doing is demonstrating to the world that this can be done. That right. You can yeah. you can have a complete and total police state, and completely eliminate uh, opposition, and countries like Saudi Arabia are down. Yeah, they're pretty excited about that prospect. Um, wow. Now, with the cat fully out of the bag, the Chinese government's response to this has been pretty much so what. Um, there's, a, there's not a lot of momentum to doing anything about this. And unless we vote Trump out next year, the U.S. will not be a part of any effort to stop it. Yeah. So, I mean, d- say what you want about U.S. real politique and the, the quote unquote Western order. But it was available as a, you know, as a counterbalance to things like this. There were, right. there were methods to try to curb these terrible things if people were willing to do it. But that's gone. Yep. That's completely gone. Yeah, with Trump. I mean, when when we had presidents that had e- any sense of moral morality whatsoever, and yeah. that's not that's not a Democrat or Republican thing. That's right. just a humanity thing. Yeah, yeah. And you know, a Congress that was peopled by the same, we were a bulwark against this sort yeah. of thing to some extent because everybody needed to trade with us, so we yeah. were able to to put a, extreme pressure on these on on these countries exactly. to, to treat people decently. But we don't have that now, and the Chinese are clearly uh, – they, they see that completely. It's, 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 uh, it's obvious to everybody. It's, bra- it's whatever bra- The behavior is rather brazen, isn't it? Even though they're trying to – certain aspects of it are kind of under lock and key and kept quite secret. It's not a secret that they're doing it. No, right. and, and they're not right. really denying it. And whatever it is they're doing with these camps and this, bio, this, this surveillance state, they have a plan. What yeah. that plan is, we don't know, but like I said, it, it, it can't be good. I don't know. It's giving them a lot of credit to say that they have a plan. I I think a lot of times we assume a plan and for, uh, from 
you know, higher ups who are doing stuff, I they may not ha- have a plan. It may just be build a bunch of camps. I mean, that's what we do. We build a bunch of camps here. We, you know, we separate children from their families or whatever. And then when, when people are like, "And what's step two? Right. We go. I, don't know. I well, will say, if, I if the Chinese are famous for anything, it's having a plan. That's right? what I was going to say. Well, it's long term uh, thinking. Yeah, they're they're long term thinkers. They've had it with the Uyghurs. Whatever they're doing is, you know, sorry to say, is some kind of final solution. Yeah. Um, so um, a soccer player today. This happened just today. Uh, on Friday, a soccer player named Mesut Ozil, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name, from Arsenal in England, spoke out against the Chinese government um, and spoke out against other Muslim countries not doing anything to support Muslim populations. Um, so the Chinese government today canceled the broadcast broadcast of his game in China. So, there Well, that go. happened with, the, w- with uh, one of the U.S. professional basketball teams, right? One of their... Yes, a coach. I think tweeted a coach out coach of yes. He he tweeted support for the uh, Hong Kong protesters. Oh, Hong Kong, that was it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and uh, the Chinese government brought the fucking hammer down on the NBA. And the M- NBA's biggest market after the U.S. is China. Yeah. Well, there you go. Uh, fun. Hey, thanks you're for welcome. Thanks for uh, the big pick me up there, Uncle Doug. That was delightful. Anytime. But yeah, go out there and uh, and. Tweet your support for Uyghurs and watch an entire country hate you. <laughs> yeah, I think we just will. We will. Have, we will lose our four Chinese listeners, unfortunately, after this episode. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah exactly. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, let's dry our tears a little bit and move on. Yeah. Good luck, Uyghurs. Uyghurs.